Hi, and welcome to AP US History of Lesson 5 re regarding the colonial way of life. In earlier lessons, we discussed the establishment of the colonies. Today, we're here to look at how these colonials actually lived. And first of all, if we look at the immigrants and who they were, where they came from, how they got here, historians argue that immigrations and mass movements anywhere involve what's called the push-pull theory. In other words, there's factors that both push people out of their pre-existing uh, living conditions, and there's factors that when they're pushed out will pull them in one particular area or another depending on the entice enticements and attractions of that region. So with the push-pull theory for the English colonists, the European colonists in general, some of it's rather straightforward. The pushes out of Europe were issues of religious intolerance or overpopulation or lack of economic alternatives and opportunities and political discrimination as well. The pulls to North America in particular involved an awful lot with the nature of how colonial charters were set up. And some charters, for instance, New York and Pennsylvania come to mind, that are quite open to immigration, saying, come on over, we need to fill these areas up. Also, the pulls here, because there was a major enticement for labor here and people could get labor here, the indentured servant model also pulled people into this specific area because not all global areas had this sort of a uh, contract and work relationship. So the first American population explosion then would be 16, the century about 1680 to 1770. And there's three main factors that account for it. One is natural increase. We've been talking in all of our earlier units about the notion of immigration to the New World as being sort of like a, like a conveyor belt. What you were having is people from the Old World were coming and being dropped off. And in significant numbers, they were dying almost as quickly, almost as rapidly as they were showing up. They were, being, uh, they were dying from, uh, from disease, from the, the traumas of, the, of coming over, infant mortality was high, etc. So you had a population being shoveled here to fill the space in, and as quickly as they died, we were going to try to, sh European nations were trying to shovel more in. Well, after a century of being here, you've got a population now that is sort of stuck around, and those that are stuck around are in a position to produce offspring who are also going to survive this experience more and more. There's, there's no more seasoning or seasoning of the immigrant or seasoning of the colonial to a lesser degree. They've become acclimated to the area. So natural increase plays one role in this element here. Um, you also see further new immigration from the Scotch-Irish. Um, German and English immigrants are still coming over because of the enticements this area has with the indentured model and the uh, labor needs and the acquisition for uh, small amounts of land or small amounts of land for small landholders. African slavery, of course, at this point becomes systematically integrated as a large-scale model through which you see a mass transshipment of hundreds of thousands to millions of individuals coming over. During this point in time, the 1680s, 1770s, we start to see slavery become the economic model for the southern colonies, the colonies of Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and even Maryland. But at this point in time, all colonies have slavery legal. Legalized slavery exists in all colonies at this point in time, and that's important to remember for the exam. It's not simply a matter of the northern colonies, you know, not liking this model, not being involved in it. The north was involved up to their eyelids. After all, it was northern shipping that northern shipbuilding and northern shipping in general that provided the transportation, the transit for slaves from the Middle Passage from West Africa to the Indies or to uh, North America. So in many of the southern colonies, slaves made up close to half of the population by the time you get to the end of this time cycle. What were the traits of colonial society in general, though? First of all, some of its hallmarks, overwhelmingly Anglo-Saxon. You're talking about predominantly peoples of northern and western Europe, predominantly Protestant in nature, a modest amount of Jewish immigration, a very modest amount of Jewish immigration, a modest amount of Catholic immigration, but for the most part, you're talking about a people from northern and western Europe who are, who are Protestant. Religious diversity, along with that Protestantism, came in a host of ranges and sects and varieties. At this point in time, an important transition for you to be aware of is that the Puritans, as we know them, begin to become, they begin to change, their, their name becomes changed in what we would know today as the Congregationalist Church. If there's a Congregationalist Church or denomination in your community, it can trace its DNA all the way back to the Puritans of New England. Their, the name Puritan was a name they were given, it wasn't really the name of their church. As a church, they become known as Congregationalists. But you see a widespread of Protestant denominations show up in this period during this time. The Episcopalians, the uh, Baptists, the Methodists, etc. Also, it's an area that uh, was very, very consumed with the notion of self-government, very devoted to the idea, these colonies were, of embracing the best aspects of salutary neglect. Salutary neglect was the concept that at their founding, the colonies were not 
important enough to be super micromanaged by the crown. And even if England had wanted to micromanage them, they really couldn't. They were an ocean away in a world without fax machines, cell phones, internet, email, any of that kind of stuff. So the colonials had to, as a nature of necess as a matter of necessity, had to get used to making their own decisions. And what they discovered is when they made their own decisions and as they made their own decisions, that's something they rather liked to do. It's fun to make your own decisions. And so they were devoted to that idea of self-government. They enjoyed that process. They, they felt it was the natural order of things. Lastly, this was an aspirational society. And what we mean by this being an aspirational society was that immigrants were sort of uh, have-nots, if you will, from Europe, mostly of lower middle class origins, who were coming to America in search of land, territory, or a better life, a, way to, a means to better their economic station. And they were looking forward to this better future in the new world. This is going to be uh, something that's going to be reinforced by their experiences and the experiences of people that they would know in our later lessons, which is going to further draw and pull more immigrations over. Now, when it comes to regional characteristics, we're going to look today at three key regions on the map. We will look at New England. We'll look at the so-called middle colonies. They might not seem to be too much in the middle to you, since we're talking about Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey for the most part. These will be the middle colonies, maybe a little bit of Maryland. And then we'll look at the southern colonies. So in historical conversations, you're looking at southern, middle, New England. Those are your three. Okay, And so they did vary regionally based upon a number of factors involving law, governance, uh, social values, social class, social stability, economics, and not the least of which, climate and geography. So to begin with the plantation south, as we talked about, slavery was not only found in all southern colonies, but to extend beyond that, slavery was legal in all colonies during this point in time. Primary crops are tobacco and rice, and this is important for AP US history. You live in a world probably where when you think the south, you think cotton and the cotton gin. That comes later. As colonial cash crops, you're talking rice, tobacco, and indigo. These are the primary cash crops that were raised in these areas during the period we're talking about now. So don't fall into the cotton trap of generalizing for something that comes in a different part of the chronology. As well as that, the first families of Virginia, the so-called FFVs that you see on your slide, there's an elite group of families, an extended group of clan, or clan networks that come to dominate the political life of the South. People like the Lees, the Fitzhughes, the Bradfords, etc. They come to dominate the, the living and life arrangements, the political clout of this region. They dominate their, how the laws get made, they dominate in the legislature, and the entire social pyramid there on the very top of it. Establishment of schools and churches was difficult in this region because it was not a region of large towns. It was a region of either small-scale agriculture or large plantation estates. And as such, you don't have a lot of communities around which you can build that regional school or school model. So education sort of became, I guess you could say, a class-based thing. The higher your level of social class and economic means, the greater your access to education was. And last of all, Confrontations, going from Bacon's Rebellion forward, confrontations with Native Americans were frequent because the idea was further westward expansion into territories and taking of land that the Native Americans saw as their own to privatize for uh, individual use. Into our middle colonies, we said we're talking now largely about New England, or I'm sorry, not New England, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey on our map. What do we know about the middle colonies? They had the best of both worlds. They were going to be colonies that were going to be economically diverse because they were going to do some of what New England would do and some of what the southern colonies were going to do. They had quite fertile soil, nice long growing season, not as long as the south, but long enough. These would become the colonial bed basket, baskets in many ways. They export lots of grain. The uh, Hudson River Valley, Pennsylvania will become granaries for all the colonies in many ways. The fur trade of the interior gets accessed through some rivers that we see through Pennsylvania, through New York, heading inland. And the fur trade becomes increasingly important as an item that England is choosing to use in their mercantilist model. So there's a lot of money to be made and generated from heading inland for that sort of extractive activity. Understand that having a, having a farm is not really extractive. You settle, you literally put down roots. But with the fur trade and some of, the, and some of these other uh, tra lumbering, logging, etc., the idea is to take what's here, extract it, remove it and then bring it back. So it's not like you're setting up a permanent community the way that agricultural uh, farming interests would during this time. Land holdings were also intermediate. In other words, you're talking about a non-plantation economy. Maybe not as small as the New England family farm, but certainly not the kind of holdings you're seeing among the first families of Virginia. Um, the middle colonies were more ethnically mixed. 
Uh, you've probably already learned in your courses about the notion of New York and Pennsylvania having the most open immigration policies of all the colonies. So you're going to see this large kind of uh, entrepot kind of communities being set up with large diversity of, of backgrounds. And you've got a lot of economic and social democracy in these colonies. Along with this, these colonies were set up in ways that allowed them to devote themselves more to free market capitalism than to any one specific church or any one specific uh, economic social slavery model or anything along those lines.